Hey there, how are you guys? Welcome to the show. This is the Other People Podcast. I'm Brad Listy in Los Angeles. It's good to be with you. Thanks for listening. Hope you're doing okay. Don't forget to subscribe to this show wherever you listen. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Follow the program on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky. So today I'm going to be talking with C. Pam Zhang, author of a new novel, called Land of Milk and Honey. It always felt like there was some kind of pain between myself and that writing. It didn't really feel true to me. And so I think a lot of my journey as a writer boils down to sort of feeling like I'm like stripping away layers of received knowledge until I get to that innermost layer, which is what do I feel? What do I think? What do I believe is most important and not even most important you know again in the sense of like how will people receive it but most important to me what feels urgent to put on the page what feels true all right that was c pam Zhang. her new novel is called land of milk and honey available from riverhead books land of milk and honey is a novel about seeking pleasure in a dying world It takes place in a time when a toxic smog has spread over the planet, causing widespread extinction and eradication of food sources. The protagonist of the book is a young chef who takes a job working at a mountaintop colony in Europe owned by a very wealthy man. This is in the border region of, I believe, France and Italy. And it is there at altitude that skies are clear and food is plentiful. And the chef finds herself enmeshed in the lives of the global elite. And in particular, in the lives of her employer and his daughter. Land of Milk and Honey is, among other things, a climate novel, a dystopian novel, a novel about pleasure, a love letter to food, and the story of a woman who is learning to embrace her own appetite. My conversation with C. Pam Zhang is coming up in just a bit. A quick reminder before we get started that I do an email newsletter each week, and it is now on Substack. This is a recent development, so if you would like to receive my email newsletter, or read it online, head on over to Substack and search for me by name. You can subscribe. The newsletter is pretty simple. I let you know about the latest episodes of the show, and I also share links to things that I have been reading and finding interesting. So if that sounds good, if you would like to hear from me in your inbox once a week, you can subscribe to the newsletter over at Substack. Likewise, you can join the Other People Patreon community over at patreon.com slash otherpplpod. You can get merchandise, a book club subscription. It's a great way to help keep this show going into the future. Patreon.com slash otherpplpod. Today's episode is brought to you by Harper Books, publisher of the novel Penance by Eliza Clark, author of the cult hit entitled Boy Parts. Penance is a chilling and brilliantly told story of murder among a group of teenage girls on a beach in a rundown seaside town on the Yorkshire coastline. 16-year-old Joan Wilson is set on fire by three other schoolgirls. Nearly a decade after the horrifying murder, a journalist named Alex Z. Corelli has written the definitive account of the crime drawn from hours of interviews with witnesses and family members, painstaking historical research, and, most notably, correspondence with the killers themselves. But how much of the story is true? Nylon Magazine says, quote, Penance dives into the depraved obsession with true crime, class, and power in a distressing look at young women and the darkness of the human spirit. That is, penance the new novel from Eliza Clark, available now from Harper Books. 
Okay, so my guest once again is C. Pam Zhang. Her new novel is called Land of Milk and Honey, available now from Riverhead Books. C. Pam Zhang is also the author of a novel entitled How Much of These Hills is Gold? This was her debut. It was nominated for the Booker Prize. She is, in addition, the winner of the Academy of Arts and Letters Rosenthal Award and the Asian Pacific Award for Literature. She was a finalist for numerous other prizes, including the Penn Hemingway and the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize. Pam's writing appears in a variety of publications, including The New Yorker, The Cut, and The New York Times. She is a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35 honoree and a New York Public Library Coleman Fellow. I am very pleased to have C. Pam Zhang on this show and I'm excited to share the conversation with you guys right now. So let's get to it. Here she is, ladies and gentlemen. This is C. Pam Zhang, and her new novel, One More Time, is called Land of Milk and Honey. It was very surreal. I don't think I saw my book in a store until a year after it had come out. So it it felt very acute, the difference between the life the book was having out in the world and the life that I was having in my little prison of a house as as we all were imprisoned. And you, I want to say, were living in San Francisco during the pandemic, but then moved to, I think, I think you and your partner like rented, I read, a house in some tony suburb of seattle yeah. or something like sight unseen it was a very strange experience so what happened is you know we were living in a one bedroom in san francisco and that had been fine because ordinarily we had the amenities of the entire city and once the lockdown happened we put out some search on zillow for rentals and i think the criteria were anywhere in the united states within our budget with preferably a view. And so we ended up getting this strange house in a suburb of Seattle called Medina, Washington. And we were in this second house on our landlord's property. There's 3,000 residents or so in Medina, and at the time they included Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates. We were in this like strange one bedroom that our landlord was planning to renovate and then flip but then couldn't in that year and so rented it out at a very low price. And so we had beautiful views. We were in a beautiful part of the world, but you know, the heaters didn't always work. There was no air conditioning. The floor was cracked. There were a bunch of spiders. And more than that, we had no community, right? Um, Because the pandemic kept people inside and in a town of the uber wealthy, inside really meant inside. Like our neighbors all lived in compounds that were gated or had enormous hedges out front where they had their own private chefs, their own basketball courts. They had their own worlds. It was a, it was a very eerie experience that definitely informed the writing of Land of Milk and Honey. So did you ever see any of these really high profile neighbors did you ever lay eyes never the high profile ones i believe we once met a neighbor because our dog had run off and the neighbor brought our dog back so that was nice okay but i feel like this experience informed your imagination when it comes to the land of milk and honey right like this sort of like barricaded create your own world reality that the super wealthy had Uh, the ability to have during the pandemic versus the experience that everybody else had. Definitely. There was, you know, I walked my dog on the same route every day for the year that we lived there. And I don't think it was until maybe the last two months that I realized that on one particular block, I thought I was passing one house and then another house and then another house. And I realized they were all part of the exact same compound, right? And at the same time that I saw no sight of my neighbors, I was reading articles that would come out about things like Elon Musk's uh, Mars adventure um, and reading about these efforts to create either utopias or dystopias, depending on who you're talking to, by the uber wealthy. And that was their way of responding to a global crisis. Yeah, I've had this theory in my head that eventually what we're going to be headed for, if 
the climate remains sort of unchecked and the temperatures, especially in the hotter months, become so severe and the weather events continue to sort of escalate in their severity that eventually we're going to have what are what I call bipolar people, like people who are super wealthy who basically flip poles. They go to the north northern hemisphere during the you know times when it's good to be there and then when the weather starts to get bad there they just go down to the southern hemisphere to their like safe ranch in New Zealand or whatever but that sort of feels like it's going to happen right yeah i mean it already happens to some extent now i live in brooklyn and it is interesting to see how in the summer so many people disappear because they have second homes in the hamptons right so it's already happening and the phenomenon this bipolar phenomenon that you're predicting is just uh, extending the reach of that a little bit so another thing that I have read uh, in prepping for this that you have said is that you think it's advisable if you're talking to, I believe, like a writer asking for advice, you would advise them to write into what is most frightening, like write toward the things that scare you. That would seem to be the case with this novel. Like you're writing into climate disaster like kind of like I, I mean in the world of the novel it's kind of like a smog apocalypse i don't know how you would characterize it but <laughs> this is something that you have spent some time thinking about i guess the pandemic as well was kind of bringing it top of mind mm -hmm. yeah i was writing into the smog apocalypse that felt tied to my years living in california and then in washington state where there were wildfires every single summer that I was writing this book. I actually think there were wildfires every single summer that I was writing um, my debut novel too, but they only more recently came to national and international attention. So I was definitely writing into this fear of what would it be like if we didn't see the sun again, if this sort of daily kind of beauty that we're all, all accustomed to, having a view of clouds and blue sky, if that disappeared. And these thoughts were compounded by the fact that in the midst of the pandemic, 2021, when I wrote Land of Milk and Honey, I was robbed of all sorts of other pleasures, including the pleasure of eating a meal out with friends. I've always, not always, but for a long time, I've really loved food and loved dining out. And when I wasn't able to turn to chefs and other people for that kind of experience, I realized that there is a special kind of nourishment you're getting from dining out that is separate from the food, right? It's the companionship. It's also that kind of mundane surprise of not having made what you're putting in your mouth, of being surprised and getting a little bit of a peek into somebody else's viewpoint or culture or background in that way. And in the pandemic, I just kind of lost my appetite. I was eating the same boring things that I was making for myself every day. And so the fear came from this place of what if we all kind of survived in some form on an apocalyptic earth, but lost this ability to take pleasure in daily life. Yeah, this is definitely a novel that is uh, concerned with the pleasures of life. Like it's a very uh, like vivid book in that way. The descriptions of food, the descriptions of sex, the descriptions of the body, the landscape, like you can really feel that. And that it, that was something that we were to greater and lesser extents deprived of during the pandemic. It was kind of this removal of so many of the things that I think we had previously maybe taken for granted as yeah. every day. Yeah, speaking of the experience of having a book come out during that time, I saw another author post on Twitter that performing at a digital event was like speaking to a room full of ghosts and that really resonated with me. It, that idea still haunts me a little bit. And I would take it one step further to say it, just, it didn't just feel like you were interacting with a room full of ghosts if you had a book out or if you were doing a Zoom meeting, but it kind of felt like we all became ghosts to some extent, right? Um, we were so disconnected from, from our bodies. Yeah. I don't know. I had like... I feel bad saying this, but like, I feel like my pandemic experience wasn't that much different wow. from like, how I mean, like, I don't go out enough, I think. <laughs> I'm sort of a shut in, but I was just like, yeah, I'm just back here working. I think in some ways I liked it because it removed distractions. I was able mm. to write. 
I was able to write well just because my day-to-day family stuff, the kids going to school, like a lot of that stuff got narrowed or like taken away. And also like there was less, I feel like there was less capitalism, like there was less drive Mm. and like there was less pressure to achieve. It was like, well, we're all home. It's all, do you know what I'm saying? Like I felt kind of, it felt kind of like a relief in a way that people weren't so fixated on tasks and getting shit done and achieving no i can actually see that because i think that is one of the questions in land of milk and honey as well right this chef who escapes the smog choked world and gets to go to this luxurious mountaintop retreat um, where she suddenly has all the ingredients and in- available to her she suddenly has sunshine she has uh, opulence and abundance and for a long time that is something that she sinks into like she loves that initial feeling of relaxing into it right um and so i definitely understand that i think for me it as someone who also takes long periods to just sort of hermit myself away and do the work i always reach this point at which i wonder okay but do i need to be in the world more do i need to also see other people and experience what other people want Um, I do think that for myself, I've found that I kind of need to switch between those modes seasonally, but you're certainly right in that isolation isn't in and of itself a negative. So if you're seasonal about it, I'm I'm imagining like you're out and about more in like the spring and the summer and then you hermit in the colder months. Is that right? Oh yes. I'm absolutely looking forward to a grim New York winter. (laughs) Okay. Okay. So let's, and you just, you just kind of touched on it, but it's good for listeners who have not had a chance to read to kind of get the setup of this novel, which is a great kind of like high concept idea, which is like hauntingly plausible. You have a world enveloped in a kind of toxic smog that kind of crashes the biodiversity of the planet, causes extinctions and you know, very limited access to food. I want to say most people on the planet are surviving on something, what's it, mung, protein, soy, algal, <laughs> flour. <laughs> That's a mouthful, but oh, yeah. you know, like dire circumstances. And yet there is something called a quote, elite research community that has been formed on a mountain in Italy, which is above the smog. So at elevation, you can sort of clear the smog if you have the real estate and you have essentially like a super rich dude who is trying to create an intentional community for other super privileged people where a lot of the pleasures of existence are being cultivated. Uh, And this protagonist, this chef, is brought on board to prepare food for these people, essentially. Did I miss anything? No, I think you covered it all. Okay, so a couple of questions. Like, first of all, I, I think we can sort of deduce how this idea came to you but uh did it begin with the chef like where did it begin Hmm. it did begin with the chef so you know we've been talking a little bit about how i wrote it during the pandemic but i in many ways hesitate to call it a pandemic novel because i think that implies a level of bleakness and grimness that was not the intention if anything this was the book that sort of broke me out of that world of bleakness. Um, The idea for it came uh, soon after I was vaccinated and I had one of my first meals out at this beautiful Filipino restaurant in Seattle named Musang. And I was with my partner, I was with a friend, an old friend who was a doctor at the time. And so you can only imagine how hard his previous year had been. And as we were first catching up you know we sort of like talked about the the biography and the details of the previous year and again all these like kind of like facts of what had happened were weighing down on us and then i remember the moment when the food arrived at the table and we all went quiet looking at it and there was this kind of beautiful silence as we began eating and i could see on the faces of my dining companions this kind of return to their bodies and to the joy of being there together and of just like being in the moment tasting what is on your tongue not worrying about all the things that had happened the year before not worrying about all the many other problems still going on in the world but just food being this portal to respite 
that was really, really powerful. And that's what got me thinking about the chef as the protagonist of this novel. I, I want to say one of the reviews that I read referred to this book as, quote, the world's first gastronomic apocalyptic thriller. <laughs> Did you? I kind of like that. You can't argue with it, right? <laughs> no, I'm. In fact, I'm. I've been so deeply curious as um, reviews appear to see how people describe and receive it because it is, in many ways, a novel that steps over or steps into many genres. So, it, always curious to see what readers make of it. Yeah, it's also, I think, been described often as gothic, and you know the writing you talk about how this was kind of a reaction against the pandemic and the way in which you broke out of the malaise that had sort of settled over the world with respect to those lockdown months or lockdown years. And it's very evident on the page. It's almost like you can feel like it's almost like a celebration of food and the sensual and the writing is really exquisite. Your ability to write about food is notable. And it made me think like, well, this is a person who knows how to cook. This is a person who <laughs> can like, you know, whip up the most delicious thing. I'm a very limited cook. I, I make my own stuff, but I don't have the time. Uh, or at least I don't make the time to do a recipe and mince things. And, uh, you know, for me, it's gotta be something I can make in 10 minutes. But mm. are you... Yeah, you, you would be, I feel like <laughs> if you knew how I ate, you would be appalled. I haven't been to a restaurant for a proper meal in, and I don't care, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm just like, I'm, I don't have time, I feel like, to do it. You gotta get a babysitter. It's like, oh, forget it, I'll just eat at home. And I'm always, I feel like I'm working too much. But anyway, uh, I'm wondering about your background with food. Like, are you an enthusiastic chef uh, uh, you know on your own do you love to cook or are you simply somebody who loves when other people cook <laughs> well <laughs> um i would say that my approach to cooking is very similar to my approach to writing i do it when i'm motivated and when there are creative juices flowing but i what i don't like is to turn it into a daily chore because i think that steals the magic away from it so you know when i'm writing there are periods all right kind of frantically every single day, hours a day for, you know, six weeks, often when I'm drafting. And then I won't touch anything for six months because I want the well that has been depleted to fill up again, right? I want to feel like I need to get back to the page. And so for cooking, it's often similar. I move through cycles like right now, I think because I am sort of creatively tapped out by publicity for this book and by working on a new project, I haven't cooked in my own kitchen properly for maybe three or four months. When I do, I just throw together really good tomatoes or stone fruit from the farmer's market, or there's a place in Chinatown I go to that has the best fresh tofu, but is often throwing like two or three fresh ingredients together with like spices in my kitchen so i don't think i would be appalled by the way you eat necessarily I, mean, I eat the same thing over and over again i i mean i'm just and yet i love i mean take me out to a, a lovely dinner at a restaurant i will have a great time I, you know what i'm saying i like i like eating and i like food but i just it's sort of like clothes i'll wear the same thing over and over again it's like i consider it like a uniform i don't like having to make choices, I think. It's like it's like less mm -hmm. stressful to me to just be able to like know what it's gonna be. <laughs> yeah, so. but you know, I also think that's that kind of contrast in your life is important. I think that if you were to eat, you know, a Michelin starred meal out every day, you would get tired of it. It would cease to become interesting to you. You would achieve this kind of glut. And that is like one of the questions in the book as well, right? As much as this chef is in this incredibly privileged place where she has access to all the quote unquote finest ingredients, what do those ingredients mean at the end of the day? Like at what point does a meal cease to become about the food and about the meal and become instead a status symbol? And how do you sort of like square those ideas, especially if you are in a culinary profession? So I think that the way you approach your culinary life actually sounds pretty good. Okay. Well, thank you. I was worried about that. 
but I and I should say I, now that I say all this about not having a restaurant meal in a long time, I, I'm totally forgetting we just celebrated my mother's 75th birthday, and we went up to uh, San Inez and I ate at a Michelin restaurant in is it Los wow. Alamos? Have you ever heard of Bell's restaurant in Los Alamos? No, I haven't. Okay, it's like this little one room. I mean, this town is like a one stop sign town in mm. you know north of uh, Santa Barbara. And it's like there's just this cool old like vintage building. It's one room. The stuff on the menu, I mean, it was like lunch. So the it was like 16 bucks for a salad. It wasn't like super expensive, but it's got Michelin stars. It was delicious. You should check mm. it out. You would appreciate it, I bet. Yeah. But and what was the atmosphere of the place like? Ca- like chill, like kind of like, vi- like a vintage. You'd have to like look online. I'm th- again, very limited mm. in my ability to describe interior design, but like... And I don't even know what the what the architecture style would be, but like very high ceilings and kind of this old floor and just like simple and like not a ton of tables. And the menu was very short, which I also sort of appreciate. I feel like when I go to a restaurant and there's like a 50 page menu, it's like, OK, this is too much. But when somebody's just like, this is what we do. We do it really well. Here you go. I tend to think that's a good sign. It's like a sign of yeah. confidence. It sounds like you also felt like you were being taken care of. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, in a way that felt unpretentious. Mm-hmm. And they, everybody was just, yeah, it was very good service, but like low key and a lovely lunch. So I should note that I do have some street cred now. I've been to a, a decent restaurant in the last <laughs> year. <laughs> so, and you are a fan of Top Chef, I read. Is this correct? This is part of your culinary education as well? Yes, so much a fan of Top Chef. I don't, I can't believe, I think there's been 21 seasons now and I started watching it, um, not when it aired, but I started watching the, the reruns, I think, when I was in college. And so it's been a huge part of my life. And then, you know, just to kind of uh, talk a bit more about the food writing and the body writing and just the sensory aspect of this book. uh, I read that, you know, when you were starting out as a writer, some of the earlier efforts that you were making to write fiction, you would say or you have said that you were trying to write these fake white stories where you lost the body on the page. Mm-hmm. I, I don't feel like that was a problem at all in the land of milk and honey. <laughs> so this is something that you've sorted out. But can you just talk a little bit about the process of getting from there to here? Yeah, I think that as a younger writer, I was motivated a great deal by external expectations and sort of an imagined external reception, right? And this had a lot to do early on with the literary canon that I had encountered, which was largely white and male and middle to upper middle class. And so my first attempts at fiction were attempting to replicate those kinds of scenarios. And because I hadn't lived them, because I didn't feel them, it always felt like there was some kind of pain between myself and that writing. It didn't really feel true to me. Um, And so I think a lot of my journey as a writer can boils down to sort of feeling like I'm like stripping away layers of received knowledge until I get to that innermost layer, which is what do I feel? What do I think? What do I believe is most important? And not even most important, you know, again, in the sense of like, how will people receive it? But most important to me, what feels urgent to put on the page, what feels true. And so this, this book, Land of Milk and Honey, is I don't want to say it's the pinnacle of that. I hope I haven't reached the pinnacle of that. Um, But it was a way to dive deeper. It is a first person narrator. It is a first person narrator who is a chef and deeply aware of all the physical sensations and perceptions that are around her. And it was a real joy to like, to be able to fully embody this one person really well on the page. So another thing that you have talked about is speculative fiction, which this book would qualify as, at least in part. And in particular, you've spoken about how important speculative fiction is for minority writers. 
Why is that? Yeah, I mean, speculative fiction is wonderful. It's sort of like a way to break break the glass, right? Um, you sort of throw this sharp question of what if, what if one thing or a couple of things change? How would that radically reorganize everything around it? And so for marginalized writers, I think that what if is such a necessary and powerful weapon. Otherwise, you often feel as I was constricted by the sort of the world and the literary canon that you're operating within. And the what if of speculate, speculative fiction is a way to just like get out, open a new door, like tumble out into some new space. And increasingly, I have also come to think that for marginalized and non-marginalized writers alike, speculative fiction is a really important way to keep our imaginations limber and to keep some degree of, I suppose, hope in a reality that feels increasingly constricted and pointed towards, towards doom, which is kind of all you see if you open up um, any kind of national newspaper is, is doom. But that isn't the, the texture and the reality of everyday life for a lot of us, or rather it's not the whole reality. Yeah, so I think speculative fiction is just a way to get us a little past where we are today. It's interesting that you say it's about hope because speculative fiction often points, I think, towards dystopian futures. You know, like what if a toxic mm -hmm. smog enveloped the world and you know the billionaires retreated to an Italian mountaintop? Uh, and by yeah. the way, uh, why Italy? Was it just because it's beautiful or was it... Uh, uh, I do think the mountains there visually have some impact on it. I will say that in the book, technically, the mountaintop is at the border of Italy and France, and it's, without spoiling too much, it's sort of a contested space. So it wasn't necessarily with an eye towards Italy itself so much as what would it look like if there was this sort of Western European enclave of the uber wealthy who were actually trying to separate themselves out. Okay. And then in terms of hope, because, you know, we talk about speculative fiction, it often points towards dystopia, especially like climate related speculative fiction these days. But you say that it's also about imagining what new possibilities, some sort of yeah. way forward that is imbued with hope. Yeah, I would argue in many ways that even the most dystopian of um, speculative fiction novels out there are are about hope, right? We talked at the very beginning about writing into fear. And I think that when you actually tackle what scares you, the result isn't scared. The result isn't cowardly or cringing, right? I'm thinking about a book like, let's take the most extreme example, like uh, The Road by Cormac McCarthy, absolutely bleak dystopian future. But the point of that is like, let us imagine if humans were put in the worst scenario possible, what emerges? There's still so much love, right? There is so much within us internally that keeps us pushing on. And so, yeah, I don't think that fear, uh, riding into fear, um, riding into dystopias and hope are separate categories. They're actually weirdly intertwined. So on a somewhat related note, I want to talk with you about fear and in particular mm -hmm. fear of the outdoors, which <laughs> you have said is something that you possess. Do you still possess it? I mean, do, is this something that has continued <laughs> for you? I mean, yeah, as in like if you dropped me in the, in the mountains, I would absolutely die within a couple of days as most of us uh, would. But so there's that fear of the outdoors, but it is that fear tinged with awe. Like I just deeply respect the outdoors. Um, I just know that it is not the place for my body. <laughs> so you've, have you ever been camping? I have been camping, but only car camping. Okay, okay. And I feel like you're exploring that. You're sort of testing your limits a little bit. I mean, this mountain community is obviously pretty posh, but there is kind of a nature element in your first novel there's a, a maybe a more pronounced even nature element. So these are things that you explore in fiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that part of my human fear about the outdoors is this understanding of its great power and awesomeness that is so much bigger than the scope of 
one human life certainly, but also bigger than the scope of humanity. And weirdly enough, I think that when we look at climate change and the future of the planet, that is a fear that again tilts me towards a lot of hope, right? I think that as much as humans have done to mess up the planet, and as much as we will continue to do to mess up the planet, it it will survive us. You know, even if we go extinct, the planet will come back from us. And that's kind of like a beautiful unknown to imagine into. Yeah. I don't think, yeah, there's like the old joke, like save the planet, like the planet's going to be fine. It's us who are going away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it is funny how like, uh, again, you know, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be um, looking to improve our relationship with the planet. And uh, certainly I, you know, am very pro technology that might change what's happening in the environment and legislation that might protect the air. But at the same time, I think I do sit back and like look at where environmentalism sometimes is just incredibly human self-interest, right? And that doesn't make it bad. That doesn't make it worthless. But it is funny just to think of how much like hubris is in that too. Well, I want to talk to you about your biography a little bit, like how you got to this point, uh, the path that you have traveled. You were born in Beijing and immigrated to the U.S. as a young child. And I want to say you had 10 different addresses by the time you were 18 years old. So you moved around a lot. Yeah, some, I can't even remember the number. But like, give me some places that you lived as a kid. Kentucky all around sort of central and northern California, including Salinas, um, where John Steinbeck lived for a great deal of time. That was really formative. I have lived in Rhode Island, Bangkok, Cambridge in the United Kingdom, have lived in Iowa, in Tennessee, um, Washington State, as we mentioned, and now New York. I can't remember if I've missed any. Wow, okay. Is there a place that feels most like home to you? Hmm. I think that right now it is, uh, it is Brooklyn. It is New York. There's something about the, I obviously don't have a very long history here, but to me, the aspect of, of home here is kind of the energy in the city. It's a city where I don't think people are mean, but they also won't give a random stranger more attention than they're worth. And I, I love that. Like New York doesn't care about you, but if you ask for help, it will offer help. Yeah, I've never had a problem with New York. Like, there's all this talk about how, you know, people are rude or this or that. And I'm like, no, people just don't, like, they're living in such close quarters with one another. So they're interacting all the time and they don't tolerate bullshit. Yes. Or yeah. su superficiality in the way that maybe other places do. And I think it's just born of necessity. But if you go up to somebody and you politely ask for directions or something, nine out of 10 people is super nice. And yeah, accommodating. I, I agree with you. It also has a quality that I look for for in all cities that I love, which is that you can walk down the street crying and no one will pay attention to you. They'll sort of just mind their own business. <laughs> <laughs> Do you often walk down the street crying? Is this like a, I a regular? I mean, I don't know about often, but it happens. And it's nice to be able to feel like you can just let it out in public. Yeah. Well, people crying on the subway is like a whole meme. I mean, it's a whole industry, I feel like, online. <laughs> people yeah, people about... crying on the subway. Yeah, people crying on any kind of transportation, I think. Like airplane crying happens a lot. Train crying is pretty great. Yeah, I actually wept while watching a movie on an airplane once. <laughs> I, feel like, I, feel, I feel like there's enough like subtle fear, like sort of churning through an airplane think a lot of us carry a little bit of fear of flying even if we're comfortable flying so i think your emotional defenses are maybe weakened at altitude but i, was I like, feel like i've heard yeah i've heard that about altitude too like emotionally maybe chemically probably yeah i was just like very surprised i'm not a weeper and i was like why am i weeping watching this cuba <laughs> gooding jr movie <laughs> i was like it, it, you know. it does mean that i always have to be very careful about recommendations i give about books or movies that I've read or seen on a plane because I have to, I'm always like, did I really enjoy it or was it the cabin fever? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Your captive audience. <laughs> so I want to ask you about 
growing up a little bit more because your first language was not English and your mother, I read, had you like shortly after you moved because your parents were here and then you came after they did, right? Mm -hmm. They sort of established a home base and then you showed up, what, when you were like four Mm -hmm. years old or something. Mm -hmm. And then your mother, to help uh, you assimilate and learn the language, would have you copy by hand children's books. Mm Mm-hmm. Is this right? Yeah, Yeah, that's correct. It's interesting. I actually struggle with those terms, like what is the first language? I think that um, definitionally English might be my first language because I learned it at that critical period of childhood. And it's certainly like my primary language now. I'm no longer fluent in Mandarin, which I which I did learn first. But yeah, it my childhood was mediated a good deal through books. Part of that was this early emphasis on reading and writing and education from my mother. You know, a lot of that came from like this immigrant fear of sort of like catching up and needing to blend in. And I also turned to books because as we discussed, I moved around so much. They were some of the most stable things in my life. I didn't own many books because we were poor, but there are certain books I would find in every single library, you know, sort of most notably, I remember Little House on the Prairie, that series was something that was really foundational because I, no matter where we moved, it would be in the library or it would be in the classroom. And it was also about a family on the move. And so I I think that as a child, it's interesting to look back and see how much of my understanding of the world was mediated through literature. Yeah. I grew up watching that television series, Little House on the Prairie. Mm. I've got, you know, I've got several years on you, but I don't know if you're familiar with it, but I, was it Mary who got scarlet fever? Yes. Oh, crushed such a me. tragedy. Yeah. I know. I know. <laughs> like really marked me, clearly marked me as a child, the fact that I remember this. But yeah, those, those stories were great. A kind of like frontier yeah. prairie existence or whatever. But what did your parents do that had you moving around so much? like from city to city yeah i mean some of it was for education my both my mother and father for different periods were in grad school some of it was i think just a search for either a slightly better school district or because rent was cheaper somewhere it's like one of those kind of mysteries of childhood that i still don't fully understand i see it now as a a sort of classic immigrant grasping towards something that might be just a little bit better than what you have. You mentioned that Salinas was formative, mm-hmm. the, the, the town where Steinbeck had lived in California, which is like east mm-hmm. of San Francisco, right? Mm-hmm. Sort of east of uh, Big Sur, like. East and south. So it is like closer. It's in, I don't know what they call it. I feel like there's the nickname, the like salad bowl of California or America, not very sexy, but it is sort of more like North Central California. So what was formative about it? Do you mean from like a culinary mm-hmm. sense? Cause that's such like a food, Yeah. Uh, what oasis, there's so much food produced there. That's a good question. So in two ways, I think John Steinbeck lived there. And so the branch of the local library that I went to in Salinas had a big old statue of him out front. I read my first Steinbeck works there. And that's certainly been formative from a literary standpoint. And yes, now that you mention it, the, the landscape, the agricultural landscape there, every single day that I walked from my family's apartment to the bus stop, we would pass these enormous, enormous fields of strawberries. And so, you know, there's a scene in the first chapter of this book that has to do with strawberries, and it is lifted in great part from those experiences in in Salinas. Not just the abundance of the strawberries, but this kind of abundance that begins to rot at the end of the season because there's too much fruit and it's just sitting out there in the fields, in the hot sun, it's, it's strange because while Salinas was fertile and abundant and produced a lot of great produce, at least the part of the town that my family lived in was not very, very well off. A lot of my 
friends around me, their, you know, their parents worked uh, blue collar jobs. And maybe that's in the book too, this like fascinating contrast between abundance, but abundance that is largely shipped off elsewhere and these sort of dry and like rotting fields that remain for a good deal of the year. Yeah, I'll tell you this, after reading your novel, I feel very self-conscious about refrigerating my strawberries and eating them, (laughs) not eating them at room temperature. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think it doesn't matter so much unless you've got like a perfect strawberry, which is rare these days. Yeah, I mean, I feel like they, I feel like strawberries spoil quickly. Like they don't, you don't have a ton of time with a, a, you know, a basket of strawberries or whatever. What do you call those little green baskets? It's a basket, you know. I would call it a basket. Yeah, especially if you've got like the really good, small, like local strawberries, those only are good for like a day or two, which is as it should be. Yeah, exactly. They're meant to be eaten like straight from the market. So uh, in the interest of time, I do want to kind of like fast forward a little bit to, you know, college, you went to Brown, you majored in English. I'm going to kind of summarize here just for Mm -hmm. the sake of time. You, I think majored in English and had your heart in books and literature and writing but had also this kind of practical interest in making sure that you were able to support yourself and get by which is common i think it's common for a lot of people i think it is maybe particularly common among first generation americans or people who have gone through financial struggles and you then went to san francisco and worked a startup job kind of did the the safe thing right you did the professional thing you had some success Mm -hmm. and you still work i think i think in a a startup or something like that you're still working in a office environment but that startup then went kaput or you got laid off at which point you took your savings and moved to thailand Mm -hmm. i want to talk a little bit about that because that's a that's a kind of that was like the big creative leap right it was like okay this happened i'm 25 years old I want to see if I can write a book. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that creative leap was only possible one, because I felt like at that point I had a bit of a financial cushion from having worked at and then been laid off with severance from a startup. So, you know, I can never discount how important it is for artists to have that kind of stability and that kind of safety net, which um, so, so far too many, especially for marginalized populations don't get right. And then moving so far and out of the country also made that kind of creative leap possible because, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about my how my earliest experiences in writing were unintentionally uh, geared towards an external gaze. And once I moved out of America, like that external gaze sort of fell away. I felt like I was unseen and invisible because I was out of the country. That distance from this country really allowed me to be honest about how I felt about it to myself and be honest on the page in a way that hadn't been fully possible when I was not only living there, but sort of working within its uh, capitalist system and getting the rewards that you do um, when you are considered a valuable cog in that machine. So you wrote a lot when you were in Thailand. I stories. wrote a lot. I, I wrote probably like 10 or 15 short stories. I wrote the first draft of my first novel, How Much of These Hills is Gold. How long were you, how long were you there? Uh, like nine or 10 months. So you were busy. I was busy, but it didn't feel busy exactly, right? Um, and that has to do with my firmly held belief that it's important to have periods of productivity and then important to like let the fields lie fallow for a while and just like I this works for many people but I could never be a right every single day at the desk at a certain time it would I think just having worked a nine to five for so long it would make writing feel like a job and that feels like the death of creativity I'm, I'm, you're hearkening back to these, uh, strawberry fields where, you know, the, wreck, <laughs> yes. the wreckage, you've got to let that wreckage happen. That's uh, <laughs> clearly made an impression on you. So yeah. you then went to Iowa to the writer's workshop 
and I would imagine finished your debut novel there, like finished it out. The novel is actually done by the time I arrived at Iowa. It had already been sent out to my agent, and I think like we, we sold it maybe within a month of my being there. So the novel never touched the actual workshops at Iowa. Interesting. Interesting. And then it goes on to be long-listed for the Booker Prize, like a wonderful debut, kind of a dream, right? Yeah, yeah. A, a dream. A, it, again, a dream and surreal, right? During the pandemic. Yeah, because you couldn't really fully enjoy the spoils, right? You couldn't travel freely or go do a lot of the things that a, a Booker long listy would normally do. Yeah, it's, it's true. Um, I think also at the time I was so concerned about the state of the world, right? I wasn't even thinking about not getting to do an event with my book. I was like, are indie bookstores going to survive the pandemic? So it was also just like hard to focus on the wonderful things that were happening to me um, because there were so many bigger things to worry about. So I feel like this is your redemption tour with this novel now that the <laughs> pandemic has at least receded to a degree where people are, you know, we're back to quasi-normal. Are you like doing extra book tour this time? <laughs> I mean, it feels like I'm doing extra book tour. I think I'm doing like 10, 12 something events in the U.S. and then I have 10 days in the U.K. So I, I am really excited to to meet readers. You like this part of it? I don't know if I do, right? So I'm, oh, right. I'm just deeply curious about what the experience is going to be like. I feel like I should talk to you again in like two months and see how you do. <laughs> yes. You probably, you'll probably have ditched your phone. You're going to be like in a <laughs> concentrated fallow period, like self-enforced. Oh, no, I know <laughs> I will be, but I think that's, yeah, I'd prefer to live my life in the extremes, I think. And I guess that would mean that you do not have another project going, or do you have something from the past that is sort of like on the back burner? Yeah, I am working on something right now. Last year, um, while I was sort of going through the last stages of edi editing Land of Milk and Honey, I was working on a new book at the New York Public Library's Coleman Center, um, where I had an office and a fellowship for a year. So that work is going on. Any hints as to what it's about, like even just broadly? No, but it's going to be very different. But this is a trend for you. You like to depart from whatever you've done previously, at least so far. Yeah, I, I would get, there was actually, a, what I will say about this current project is there was an early draft of it that I actually read at an event and, you know, my agent and my editor were there and they were very excited about it and complimentary. And then two months later, I just deleted all of that because I felt like I was doing something, I was doing something well, but I was doing something I had done before and it was just not interesting to me. So you, you were bored with yourself. You have to I do was, something. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. I was bored. And you're writing into fear again in some way? Like, is it something that you're moving mm. toward? Yeah. I think there is there's certainly like, zones of fear in this book but i think i'm also really interested now in writing into love as well and those can are often paired i think right um when you love something very deeply you also fear its loss but yeah i think writing land of milk and honey um kind of unlocked that a little bit for me i'm like really curious about love on the page too yeah it's terrifying to love someone <laughs> <laughs> right? You're like, oh my God, what's going to happen? You know, and eventually it will happen. You'll be parted from this person. It's terrible, but it's the, it's the price of admission, I guess. Uh, yeah. I got to ask you too, do you have a cat? This cat in this novel, it really got to me. Like I'm wondering about your, uh, you said you had a dog. I think you have a dog and a cat. So I have two dogs at the moment. I used to have cats. Um, they both have sadly passed away. So mm. in, in the book is dedicated to, to my cats, um, to Spike and Bagu. And it was a way of memorializing them, of setting them down. Yeah, that's nice. That's lovely. It's another thing that stinks is having, I've always had pets and you gotta go through that. And I always say, Every time I lose a dog, I've only had dogs. My wife is like terribly allergic to cats, but I'm always like, this is it. I'm never getting another dog. I'm not doing this again. And then like three to six months later, I will be Googling like puppy 
like rescues and I get into it. It always happens. That's how, that is how it is. Like the human nature is stubborn. Right. But it's also like, I think once you're a pet person and you're used to having an animal in your life, it's like, how do I do life without a dog? I don't know how to do it. (laughs) It's true. Uh, All right. Well, I know you got to go. You're in demand and you have, what, an entire afternoon of media appearances lined up. So I'm going to let you go. But I really appreciate the time. And I congratulate you on Land of Milk and Honey and all the success that you've had early on in your career. And I wish you luck with this next book, which I assume will be written and finished after this nice fallow period post-book tour. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Brad. It's been wonderful on the show. All right, everybody, there we have it. That was my conversation with C. Pam Zhang. Her new novel is called Land of Milk and Honey, available now wherever books are sold from Riverhead. You can find Pam on the internet at cpamzhang.com. You can also follow her on Instagram and Twitter. One more time, the new novel is called Land of Milk and Honey. Go get your copy right away. Don't forget to subscribe to this show wherever you listen. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Follow the Other People podcast on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and Blue Sky. If you would like to receive my once-a-week email newsletter, go over to Substack and subscribe. If you would like to join the Other People Patreon community, you can do that at patreon.com slash otherpplpod. Help keep this show going into the future. If you want to do me a favor, if you have a couple of minutes and you would be so kind, I would appreciate it if you would give this show a rating wherever you listen. You can also write a review in some places. So if that's an option, write a little review. It helps the show in the rankings and the algorithm. It helps it find new listeners. If you would like to get another people t-shirt or a sweatshirt, just head on over to the show's official website, otherppl.com. Scroll down, look for the t-shirt. You can't miss it. And last but not least, if you want to read my latest novel, it's called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything. It is available now in trade paperback, ebook, and audiobook editions. I narrate the audiobook. So if you want to read my book, you can do that. It's called Be Brief and Tell Them Everything. All right. So coming up on Wednesday, I will be in conversation with author James Frankie Thomas. His new novel is called Idlewild. It is a superb debut, available from Abrams Books. Very excited about James Frankie Thomas and this novel, Idlewild. It's a mind-blowingly good debut, so stay tuned.